I'm up here. I, I get the opportunity to introduce uh, Andy Fleeter. So Andy works at a local local company, Sport Engine, here that's doing some really, really awesome things right now. Um, and w when we're going through who gets to introduce who on the uh, on the agenda on the organizers, I was like, I want to introduce Andy, but I don't know why. Uh, and I, I in chatting with Andy just right before this, I just kind of I just changed what I wanted to say about Andy. Was it? Was that I? I find myself really drawn to Andy in conversations and in talking and, and understanding uh, Andy's personality a bit more. One of the things that's really important to Andy is positivity. Um, he's just a array of of positive vibes all over the place, and so I feel like uh, people who are interested in chatting about just about anything find it really easy to approach Andy and talk to him about stuff. So, um, if you haven't had a chance to, for sure, uh, just. Uh, grab grab Andy in the hallway because it's, it's it's a super fun conversation whether it's tech or something else. But welcome Andy Fleener. Wow. Um, yeah, it's sort of tough to follow John Cowie. Um, so I mean, yeah, um, that was pretty amazing. Um, yeah, so I want to tell a story that's not directly related to this talk. Real quick, um, I know we're behind, but it'll be short. Um, so, the thing about DevOps is that the community is sort of amazing, um, and the people in this community are amazing. Um, so, I came, I, I, pr I submitted a talk last year, um, ended up giving an Ignite, um, talking with Bridget over, over the last year. Um, but while I was here, um, I actually participated in a podcast, um, sort of like just briefly. Um, and was like, this whole experience has been awesome. And then Patrick Dubois stands up after, after I talked and was like, you should give a, real, a, a big talk next year, and I expect to see you doing that. And it's like, uh. So if Patrick Dubois tells you to do something, you kind of just do it. Um, and, and I think it, what that is is it's a great story about how this community sort of embraces new New members, um, having first-time speakers like as a big part of this program is just amazing. So I'm just just really excited um, about that. Um, so yeah, let's get into let's get into the safety dance, right? Finding safety in an unsafe world. Um, so yeah, that's how you safety dance. Um, so I'm Andy Fleener. Um, I work for Sport Engine. Um, I'm a software engineer on the platform operations team. Um, I've been in the industry for about seven years, uh, just doing software development, um, and then the last three years um, has just been around operational concerns. Um, and so, the thing about Sport Engine is we move pretty fast. Um, so, we we work in two-week sprints, and in our previous sprint, we made 176 changes throughout that sprint, um, and all of those changes were what we would consider successful without any critical incidents that came from those changes. Um, and so you don't get there without sort of understanding um, what safety is. So why are we talking about safety? Um, doesn't seem super relevant, maybe, but um, system safety is like incredibly important to being able to um, sort of continue and, and, and work on your product. So um, it's also a function of how your, your organization works. Um, so you're, you, your outcomes um, with, your, with your customers and your coworkers um, are, are better the safer the system is. Um, and, and safety is key to protecting your business um, so that you can actually make money, right? Um, so there's a couple different views on, on how you go about safety. So safety one, um, what some people call the old view of safety, um, is that when there's an incident, um, there's a thing that caused it, and it's the root cause of that thing. Um, the system is just generally safe. Um, so, what I mean by that is that the only time something bad happens is when someone interacts with that system and it'll be fine without people touching it, um, which we'll get into that. Um, so safety two um, is another view, it's called the new view, um, that, and, th and the view that's, that safety two takes is that systems are inherently unsafe um, and that everything, there are just failures just lying dormant in a system. Um, and failure isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, there's lots of things you can learn from a failure. Um, so the sort of like, they're, they're, they're sort of butt heads, right? So safety two is all about learn and improve. 
Um, safety one is sort of blame and punish. Um, you find the person that caused the outage and you fire them, right? Um, so, but what does that have to do with dancing? Um, why, why are you dancing? Well, I like to dance. Um, and dancing is, is fun and safety can be fun too, right? Um, so the other thing about dancing is that it requires balance. Um, it's, it's a hard problem. Um, you have to be able to sort of work on your feet, right? Um, and th there, aren't really, there isn't really a single hammer that you're going to find um, that, that solves all of your problems. Um, and there's just business concerns to, that come into play. Um, so Sydney Decker says, um, so Sydney, Sydney Decker is a safety expert. Um, he wrote a book called, well, wrote a lot of books. Um, one of them I actually like and read um, is The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error. Um, and what he says is that complex systems are trade-offs between multiple irreconcilable goals, e.g. safety and efficiency. What does that mean? Well, that means that you can't pick the safety choice all of the time. Sometimes you have to pick the efficiency choice. And there's just no way that you can get all of that, right? So everything has trade-offs. And you have to just make the, you have to make trade-offs and then deal with the consequences of those trade-offs. So what, is, what does safety mean for software? Um, software is a complex system. Any piece of software is a complex system, in my opinion. Um, and, and that system has the same constraints as other complex systems, which um, is a lot about, is, is what Sidney Decker is talking about as complex systems. Um, so I sort of hate computers. Um, they kind of just drive me nuts every once in a while. Um, and you kind of just want to throw them out the window or like go all office space on them. Um, but <clears throat> Software is a complex system. Um, it has faults lying dormant in it. We all know that. There's bugs everywhere in software. Um, and then until, until so the, the correct circumstances happen, um, you'll, you won't even know that there is a failure lying dormant in your system. Um, so what that means is that systems are inherently unsafe. Um, failure will, will happen. Um, it's just a matter of time. Um, and all complex systems suffer from the same phenomena. Um, and this is why we can't have nice things. So, <laughs> because it's just like real terrible. I, I like how Andy was saying that uh, I radiate positivity and here I am talking about how everything is terrible. Um, so, yeah, it's a pretty tough situation to be in. Um, but what you have to understand is that the systems cause failure. Um, so, contrary to, to safety one, um, it's actually the system that is the thing that's at fault, not the person that interacted with that system. Um, which, when you start to think about that, um, you kind of realize that, 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 that humans are just part of the system and, and their interactions are just, another, you know, just part of it. Um, like, organizations are complex systems. Um, so, you might have a piece of software, but that piece of software is driven by an organization. Um, and so, the decisions you make as an organization affect that software. Um, that, that organization has the same constra constraints as any other system, just like software. Um, it has irreconcilable goals um, to meet its business needs that you will just simply never meet all of um, because you only have so much time. Um, so human factors um, is a common topic in the safety world. Um, and what does that actually mean? Um, that's that's how humans interact with a system and, and what are the outcomes from that. Um, and, and that's true for both an organizational system and a software system. Um, we all type into a console to like do something to, to our software, right? Um, the same as when you're a part of an organization, um, the things that you do have an effect on that system. And you may not realize what, the, what that effect is right away, but it does exist. Um, and so when you deal with human factors, they talk about error a lot, um, human error or loss of situational awareness or um, things that, that, that basically say the person made the wrong decision at the time, um, and that human, I mean, humans make decisions, uh, but they might not always have the desired outcome, and that's what we would call human error. Um, but I sort of disagree. I think you kind of just have to deal with the fact that things are going to fail, um, and the decision that you make around that failure, or the decision that you made to, to create that failure, um, actually is just, just a way, just a standard thing, right? Um, it's, you just have to be comfortable with, with what happened, and it's okay, and you just move on. 
Um, no one comes to work to do a bad job. Um, everyone is trying to achieve their desired goals. Um, when, when, when you get the big wins is whenever all of those goals align and they're shared. Um, but you just have to assume that people are here to do a good job. Um, so, so how do we create safer systems, right? So I've been talking about how everything is terrible um, and everything is broken, but how do we improve on that system? Um, the fact that systems are inherently unsafe, how, that's sort of a bleak outlook on how we can improve it. Um, the key thing is you just need to learn from failure and improve upon it. Um, you just have to start assuming that people are do, that did the right thing at the time with the context that they had um, and just move on from there. Um, learn learn what, what you can figure out from, from that situation, right? So every, every uh, failure is an opportunity to learn. The other thing you have to remember is that you, if you aren't that person that, that caused that failure or that was involved in that decision, right? Um, you have to watch out for hindsight bias because you aren't that person, you don't know the context that they had at the time they made that decision. Um, and so you have the benefit of hindsight. And that just generates like all kinds of extra uh, thoughts about how, how they made the wrong decision. But you just have to, you have to ignore that fact and try and understand their perspective. Um, cause is something we construct, not find. Um, and that's an important note that Sidney Decker makes in his book. Constructing cause takes time. Um, it takes empathy, um, and it, it <laughs> you're, look, you're looking for, you, you can't find a single cause. Um, there, won't be, there won't be just one cause. You may think there is, but there's lots of other things going on in the system that led up to that result. Um, so I'll give you an example. If you, if you make a deploy, and that deploy just goes horribly, um, similar to what, to what John was talking about earlier. Um, the, all of the things that led up to that, um, you, could, you could say that, that the code that failed and caused that, caused that to burn and go red is the cause of that failure, right? But it could be lots of other things, too. Right? And it is lots of other things, too. It's what were the checks and balances that went into that? And like, it even comes down to, do you even care if that, even ha like that happens, right? Which I think is important to remember that, that failure isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, you can improve your system by seeing, seeing those failures and, and just changing your system to, to fit that. Um, and the way you do that is you foster a culture of learning. So a learning culture is super powerful. Um, it allows you to just move on from trying to, it, it, it's basically the secret sauce to building safer systems, right? Um, You shorten your feedback loops. Um, you get more. Uh, you get a, you get a move faster, and you reduce the impact that that has on the business, right? Um, so what that allows you to do is fail more frequently, but have less of an actual critical incident, right? Um, it it gives you the power to fail without consequence. So the next thing I want to talk about is procedure versus practice. Um, and this is an important part of safety, right? So procedure is the thing that you have written down that is how you do this thing, right? And everybody has these, they're run books, they're playbooks, they're whatever you wanna call them. Um, and they're never the same thing as what actually happens. Um, that's, just, that's just how it is. You have to accept that they are different um, and they're just never going to be the same. Um, and, th and that's okay, and, and it, it's the, it's, it's perfectly fine because not every runbook is gonna have all of the exact information you need at the time. And what you have to do is just trust that the people are going to make the right decisions from that. Um, but you have to mind the gap. So what, what you really need to do is understand the difference between what your procedure is and, and what the actual practice that's involved. Um, the way you do that is you study the practice. Um, so how do you know um, if it's different, right? It's tough because either, either you wrote the practice and then you, maybe you don't ever actually, or you wrote the procedure and you don't actually ever practice that procedure, right? Um, 
ideally, you, you would be the person that's writing the procedure and also the one that practices it, um, which gets you closer to that. But it, that, that's not always possible. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, at Sport Engine, we, we use GitHub. Um, we have a sort of what we would call a continuous delivery workflow. Others may disagree. Um, and one of the things that, we, that involves a, a pull request workflow. Um, and so to create a pull request at Sport Engine, we built automation tooling around that to make it easier for our developers. So Sport Engine has uh, 50 developers, um, five of which are the platform operations team, um, and we're sort of in charge of managing developer happiness, right? And making things easy for them. Um, and so when you create a pull request, um, you run a command that then asks you a bunch of questions and you fill that out. And what that does is it generates a template of what the pull request looks like. Um, and so it creates that pull request on GitHub and then it's there and, and you can work it from there. Um, and so it includes things like, um, what is the impact that this change is going to have? Um, what, is, what, what are the steps that we need to take to ensure that this is fully QA'd and we understand um, what this is going to do? Um, and uh, are there any things that we need to know when we actually roll this out? Um, so we've, we've worked on this process a lot because we want to get the right wording around how, how to, to get our developers understanding what, what it means to, to deploy per code to production um, and what it means for that code to be running in production. Um, and so we try to make the, the procedure as close to the practice as possible by by just getting them thinking about um, what will actually happen when this is deployed. Um, and making it easy for them and not expecting, not expecting them to fill out that information, right? We, we, we just prompt them for that information and then it's automatic and then they give it to us. So the way you improve the system is you change it. But you have to remember that not every change um, you make will have the, the outcome that you want, right? Um, and, and that's okay. Um, but every change to the system will have an impact. Um, and, and the impact is typically depends on the size of the change, how big that impact is going to be. Um, the real impact comes from organizational change. And so my example, what I'm talking about is is we made an organizational change to help our entire dev organization understand um, what it's like to deploy code to production. So now they're all thinking about it before, before it's even close to going out. It's as soon as they've made any change, they're thinking about what that means whenever it gets deployed. Um, changing a culture of an organization can be tough, though. Um, you could end up in a situation where you've changed it for the worse. Um, and what you have to do is, is go back and, and change it again. So like, what does this have to do with safety? Um, complex systems are complex, right? <laughs> complex systems uh, are, are tough, and, and like I said, they're just built with failure um, right in. Like, it's just hanging out. Um, so to, to, to reduce the, the, the actual impact of that failure, you have to make organizational change that, uh, that allows you to do that. Um, and really, what safety is, is it's continuous improvement. Um, it's that cycle of just iteration, iteration, iteration. And then from that, you get actual system safety in the sense that whenever something goes wrong, it doesn't have as much of an impact. Um, so here's a few things uh, that that have sort of taken me down this path. Um, so the field guide to understanding human error by Sidney Decker. Um, there's a pre-accident inv investigation podcast by Todd Conklin that is awesome. Um, there's one episode called, uh, that's with Tony Mashara um, about being a practitioner uh, of, and, and how safety uh, actually impacts that. Um, and it's great. He talks about critical steps um, and knowing, if you don't know what your critical steps are, you can end up in a situation where something happened that was critical without the, the amount of checks and balances that you needed to have to perform that action. Um, Ian, Ian Malpas of Etsy gave a great talk at Velocity about failure, and failure is an option, right? Um, you should check that out. Um, it's on YouTube. It's great. 
Um, and then there's a blog called Humanistic Systems by uh, the Stephen Schrock, um, who's also working on a book that, that sounds super interesting. Um, so check out that blog. Um, so, like, how did I get to this stuff? Um, oops, sorry. Um, it's, it's, through, it's through the DevOps community, right? I mean, it's, it's folks like Alspa and, and uh, John Willis and Mark Embriaco, um, just seeing them tweet things from these places, um, just sort of builds, builds, and builds, and, th and you start to understand where they're coming from, and it's pretty cool stuff, so. Questions for Andy. I think they're pointing over there somewhere. Yes. <laughs> sure. Um, so we've been working on our deployment process for a long time. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can, can you talk more about uh, the organizational change around your deployment process? Um, and so, we, we've, been, we've been working on, on making changes easier for a long time, right? Because you make changes easier and you get, that, that helps with your velocity, right? So you can, you can get changes out faster the easier they are. Um, and so it's been, I mean, I've been on the operations team for three years now. Um, and we had a process when I started and it is, vastly different from what it was then um, to now, and we've just been iterating it on it, improving it. Um, and the organizational change is around um, getting developers more involved from the beginning to end of that cycle. Um, we're not there yet. We're not 100% done with that change. We're never going to be done with the change, right? Like, there's no such thing as done. Um, but it's, it's, all about, it's all about figuring out where you want to go and then taking steps to, to get there um, and that, that sort of help you meet that goal. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or not. I have the mic and I have a question. Oh, there's, oh, there's one back here. Then too. I won't budge. Uh, good question. Actually, that's a great question. So all of our deployment workflow is open source, and that's how we built it. Um, well, let's say it. Let's, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Pull request template is does it exist anywhere? Um, that was the question. Um, and and yes, it does. Um, the exact one that we use um, probably doesn't because it's like kind of specific to what we want. Um, but we have kind of a default one that allows you to figure it out yourself. I mean, it's all about how your organization functions um, and what what's important to you. Um, but yeah, so our, all of our deployment, most of our deployment tooling is all open source. It's on our sport engine uh, organization on GitHub. Um, there's tools like um, Octopolo, which, which actually is our deployment tool that, that works with um, AWS's OpsWorks. Um, and then there's, or Octopolo is the, no, I got this wrong. Opsicle is that tool. Octopolo is the GitHub workflow tool um, that, that you're asking about. And that's where you'll find the templates is in, in, in that application. Any other questions, hands there? Uh, so I'll ask mine just really quick, Andy. So it, in uh, talking about building a, a culture that you learn from, or that's that has learning culture, safe to fail, that type of stuff, yeah. do you have any challenges getting your environment and your system and your team to a point where um, recovery had to be made easier because you were in an environment where you needed to feel yes. safe to fail? And what were some of the things that, that helped you solve that problem? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, so in order to move fast, you have to be able to recover fast, right? Because it's more likely that something is going to fail. Um, but that thing may not be nearly as big. Um, so if, you, if, it, if it takes you a long time to make a change, it's going to take you a long time to recover. Um, but moving faster allows you to recover much quicker. But you have to have an organization that understands that. Um, and so they have to be OK with something going wrong because they know that you're going to fix it. And, and that's definitely like, something that's been, that's been uh, uh, definitely improving over time, um, sort of creating that confidence as an organization that we're going to be able to, to get there, right? That we're going to be able to fix it as quickly as possible. Um, 
and, and getting that shorter and shorter and shorter um, just, just makes everyone happier. All right, any other questions for Andy? Great, thanks Andy, awesome. Thanks.